for the second part of our interview, we're joined by Kinder Siraj, who is Head of Commercial Sales Solutions for Middle East, Africa, Turkey, and South Asia at L3 Harris. Um, welcome to the Pilot Training Connect podcast, Kinder. Thank Great you so much. Great to have much. you here. Thank you for having me. So, um, Kinda, what we're specifically interested in is to learn more about Elfri's activities, Elfri Harris's activities in the Middle East and your regions, uh, because I know even throughout the pandemic you've been quite active uh, within it. So, can you just give us an idea of and an introduction, introduction about yourself, what you cover, and uh, Elfri's activities over the past two years? Yes, sure. Um, so. I look after all of the commercial aviation solution sales for Middle East, Africa, Turkey, and South Asia. And all throughout the pandemic, we have not stopped uh, our sales activity. Actually, I would say this is one of the regions where we have continued to be quite active. We've been successful in our simulator sales. We've sold an A320 simulator to uh, Pakistan International Airlines, as well as to Jazeera also an A320, and we have sold five devices to PSAA in Saudi, Prince Sultan Aviation Academy, two full flight simulators and three lower level devices. They have also received uh, the first demo airside simulator outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy to have that in Saudi. It is a new technology. It uh, includes seven simulator uh, activities into one ground handling, baggage loader, so it consolidates uh, the capabilities of seven simulators into one device, so they are testing it out as we speak. Throughout the pandemic also we have not stopped our uh, pilot training activity. We continued training uh, Kuwait Airways MPL pilots. We have trained 120 pilots to date. There is the first um, graduates flying as first officers with Kuwait Airways currently. We never stop training Indigo pilots. And this is this is even throughout all of the pandemic? Throughout the whole pandemic. Okay. Um, we still had Indigo pilots uh, in training in our Sanford Academy in the US. Okay. Yeah, so we've been quite active all throughout. And, and um, you know what I was quite surprised about was that especially in the pandemic, airlines or some airlines specifically in the Middle East region um, as you mentioned like placed orders for full flight simulators when we look at it from across the globe most people say the aviation industry recovered the quickest in the US and North America um, based on the data that we track um, we feel like Middle East was definitely kind of recovering very quickly as well and I think that is heavily reflected as well by the orders that L3 has received. Um, so uh, talking maybe about some of uh, these specific deployments. So for uh, Pakistan International Airlines, right? That's the flag carrier of Pakistan, which has put their trust into L3 and gotten an Airbus A320, correct? That's correct. Okay. And for um, Prince Sultan Aviation Academy, for anyone who's listening, it is the largest uh, or it is the only full flight simulator training center in Saudi Arabia located in Jeddah, um, which has, I think, also around more than six full flight simulators. So also for them to, you know, in the late in the second half of the pandemic to place such a large order and to place it with L3 must be a huge sign of confidence. Uh, here in the region into the recovery and into the growth of the aviation industry. I fully agree with you and I think they have been very progressive and forward-thinking. They had not stopped planning ahead for a single moment during the pandemic. We had been in discussions with them. They knew that the recovery was coming as many in the aviation industry knew. We predicted that we will come out of this strong and there will be pent-up demand mm -hmm. for tr pilot training, um, cadet training, abanishu training, and so they actually put that into motion during the pandemic and signed for the simulators and now they will be receiving their simulators quite early on during the recovery whereas other people are now starting to think about placing orders. And, and 
to when we look at these different uh, customers I know for example that Prince Sultan Aviation Academy has already been a previous L3 customer so it's it's really great to see that they renew their interest or not renew their interest but they continue placing the confidence to really expand the operations and drive the training infrastructure growth in the Middle East together with uh, together with um, L3. I want to ask you when we look at kind of um, the industries that you cover uh, which is um, can you just share with us the industries sure. that you cover? So in our commercial aviation solutions portfolio we cover avionics products yeah. we cover pilot training uh, airline training, so uh, simulator training centers we have in London, Bangkok, and in Miami. We have um, a pilot training for Abinishu in the US and in the UK. Mm. We do flight data services, so data analytics. That is all within our portfolio. Okay, and and when you, when you look at these different uh, products ranges and the specific things that you cover, um, the geographies that you cover all also seem to be high growth areas. Yes. So when you when you look at the state of the industry now coming out of the pandemic, how would you say the regions that you cover are currently performing and, and what trends are you seeing within them? I think this market is so dynamic. It has been for the last 10 years, but I think coming out of the pandemic, it is such an exciting market to be covering because if you look at the growth plan for Saudi yeah. with Ria coming up and Flynas's expansion plans and Saudia's expansion plans and then you look at India and uh, just Air India's announcements yesterday with uh, nearly 500 aircraft on order yeah. more. Um, the growth potential is huge and it's really it's an exciting time to be working for a company like L3 Harris because our portfolio spans the whole array it, we touch every point of the airline whether it's the avionics products that go on the aircraft or the pilot training or a you know a, a stream of uh, Abinishu pilots coming through or uh, pilots that are currently hired by the airlines doing their recurrent trainings or yeah. type ratings flight data analytics or you know flight data services extracting the information from the aircraft or it is so we touch every point in an airline and yeah. the growth strategy for airlines in the region is really coming to fruition now and yeah. we're seeing that I, I think most people um, might not know how large the order books are uh, in these different regions um, how much fleet growth potential there is. I, I know you touched upon some of the airlines, you know, Riyadh, the new uh, flag carrier of Riyadh, which is going to be launched soon. Flynas, if I'm not mistaken, has over 200 or 250 aircraft uh, on order. Fly Dubai here, where we're located, has over 250, has placed an order for 250 737 MAX. Air India, you mentioned. So I think over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see significant fleet growth. Are you seeing the training organizations that you speak with, are you seeing them um, kind of have plans to uh, build out the um, Middle Eastern pilot training infrastructure to the same scale to handle all of that incoming um, training demand from the increase in fleets? Yes. So it, it depends on how quickly they can and will ramp up. So if we just look at just uh, PSAA, they already have a plan in motion to ramp up for the demand in the Saudi market. Will it be enough? Probably not. Yeah. Um, a Kuwait as well for Jazeera Airlines, a low cost carrier to place an order for their own simulator shows that they, the demand is there and yeah. they want to keep it in house. So I do see that the region has been very proactive. Uh, we see a lot of startups starting in India I mean, when you really hone in on it, there's a lot of new airlines coming out in India. There's a lot of new training centers coming up in India. Uh, they don't always make the big headlines because they're small and they're new, but there's a lot of activity happening in the Middle East and India. And we haven't even touched upon Turkey. Turkey has almost the same amount of airline, uh, air, airplanes flying as India does. Yeah. Turkey's also a very large market that is also uh, growing. Yeah, 
and and so to to just um, touch upon the point again because you're speaking to a lot of different training organizations both simulator training centers and then airlines looking at uh, um, kind of cadet programs uh, again from your perspective you know when when we when we we dis we briefly discuss kind of the fleet growth the orders that there are uh, we discuss that the you know what we know and what we track at AFM as well that their existing simulator training centers are expanding their uh, full flight simulator training capacity there's new simulator training centers startups coming into the market um, what are your thoughts on the ab initio uh, kind of flight training piece because when I look at the Middle East and, and Indian subcontinent, mm -hmm. while the full flight simulator training infrastructure is um, a fairly developed, so um, you know is there to cater to the airlines, the flight training in the infrastructure itself um, is not yet enough to cater to the demand, but is growing very quickly. So I just want to get your perspective. How are you seeing, how will airlines tackle the, you know, ab initio flight training piece? It's an interesting one because, you know, for the last, what has it been, 10 years, they, they've been saying that the pilot shortage is coming and the pilot shortage yeah. is coming, ramp up with flight schools and get ready and get prepared. Um, I think there are actually a significant number of flight schools when you look at it, really, in the Middle East and Indian region. But how many of them are up to a certain quality and standard? I think that is a more important question. Yeah. And a more important formula to look at is what is their quality and standard? How many airlines would actually do ab initio programs with those flight schools? Um, not many. Yeah. There aren't that many. And that's why they continue to go to Europe and, and North America. And I think they will ramp up in the next few years, but I think there's a ways to go. You need to keep the quality and safety standard high, yeah. especially for the pilot training um, industry in that phase of training for pilots. Yeah. It's very crucial. Um, there's a lot, and I think airlines are starting to open the tap again on programs like that. And if it's not funded by the airlines, a lot of the governments are starting the sponsorship programs again, okay. um, or they're starting to discuss opening up those uh, scholarship programs again for pilot training. Okay. And airlines are starting to engage with um, flight schools on how they can structure ab initio programs. Yeah. I think you, you make an excellent point there. Um, with with uh, David earlier, we discussed the increasing cost of ab initio flight training really being an increasing barrier of entry to a lot of the general public so so you're saying what you're seeing in the regions that you're covering is that uh, the wider ecosystem or or different stakeholders are looking to already looking at different ways governments are looking at programs to tackle um, maybe subsidizing some of the high cost of training yeah I mean Historically, Saudi, Kuwait, they, Bahrain, they've had Oman. Several of the countries in the region have had programs, scholarship programs. Once you pass the selection criteria, the airline is always involved in that as well, as well as the flight schools. Um, once you pass, then you will be granted the scholarship from the government and you will go and they will subsidize the cost of your training. And then you come back and you are hired as a first officer for the either the national carrier or whoever the government has tied up with um, to become a first officer for the airline. Okay, and and um, so it sounds like you know we both agree there is so much demand, there's so much potential which is uh, very visible um, in the Middle East, Turkey, uh, India. What are some of the challenges that you see kind of when trying to address uh, the potential of um, this pilot training demand? So the biggest challenge that we have seen uh, recently has been there just isn't enough simulator capacity. Mm -hmm. our, our training centers are full, all the training centers that we hear of in the region, in Europe, and 
Asia Pacific and North America, they're full. Yeah. So airlines have pent up demands that they need to get their pilots trained. Um, uh, Self-sponsored um, white tail cadets need type ratings. They need to get trained, uh, keep recurrence on a certain type. There isn't enough simulator capacity. Okay. So um, I think that's a short term challenge that we are seeing in the market. We have airlines from all over looking for capacity, willing to fly 12, 14 hours to get slots on a simulator and mm -hmm. the capacity is scarce. But I guess that's pretty good for L3 Harris since you're selling full flight simulators and maybe that will or, or that should hopefully translate into a lot more uh, full flight simulator orders over 2023 and going into 2024. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I think, you know, the really exciting part of all of this is everybody knew that the aviation industry would recover and bounce back. I don't think that they realized how quickly it would be. And if you look at flights, they're full. They've been full for the last year. Yep. <laughs> Simulators are full. Um, when you open the programs up for cadet pro for cadet training, you get hundreds of applicants. Yep. So the demand has not died down. That, that is a very interesting point that, that you make because from AFM, what we're tracking, especially over the last two years, we had a situation where, you know, flight schools uh, were receiving a very small number of applications from aspiring pilots, uh, but especially over the past six months or so, as the industry is recovering, as we're getting more and more pilot shortage headlines, uh, as salaries are increasing quite significantly, especially in North America for pilots, there is an increase in interest in the profession again. And our second digital platform, Aviation Fly, um, we just had a record month in terms of visitors. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're saying is so in the regions that you're covering, being Middle East, Indian subcontinent, uh, uh, Turkey, you're saying the the interest uh, by aspiring pilots has remained extremely high. Yes, and you know I think everybody pandemic started, airlines stopped flying. Uh, you know. Um, government restrictions, COVID policies. I think everybody wanted to wait and see how would the industry bounce back from this. But the minute everything opened up, the demand is there. It's still mm -hmm. there. It's it's greater than I think a lot of people expected. Okay. It's back to 2019 levels almost. Yeah. Um, in in of, our region specifically. In so in the Middle region. East and Indian yes. subcontinent. So, so um, so I think that gave a, a big push to people that were already interested in coming into the aviation industry um, so that now they are going to aviation fly. They're looking at our website to see what cadet programs have relaunched and are applying. Okay. So we have seen an increase. That's fantastic. And, and looking now or getting kind of L3's perspective on this region, where do you see pilot demand is going to be in three years time and then uh, the pilot training infrastructure, so be it Middle East, be it India, uh, how, how do you think we will see that grow over the next three years from, from L3's perspective? Yeah, I mean, l look, there's a lot of training centers and flight schools popping up. And, and we see that in India every day. Yeah. And in the Middle East um, market, maybe not as much as in India, because there already are a lot of flight schools in the Middle East. I mean, if you just look at the UAE, how many flight schools they have here, yeah. um, or take a country like Jordan, or now Oman has one, all the countries have their own flight schools. Yeah. Um, but India has a ways to go. So I feel like we are seeing them pop up left, right, and center all the time so I, I think the future is bright for them I think they need to concentrate and focus on high quality high standards so that the airlines will consider them okay uh, you know um, one interesting point uh, when we look at India which we can share through the data that we have at, at AFM side uh, India country has 1.4 billion people yeah the country currently has around 40 flight schools. 
um, the Philippines, which is a country of uh, 112 million people, has uh, used to have before the pandemic 40 flight schools. So it's like one tenth of the size, and it has yeah. the same number, if not slightly more, flight mm -hmm. schools. If we then compare that to kind of Europe and the US, yeah. the picture becomes even more uh, screwed. So I think there's really the uh, huge, huge um, growth potential on that side. On the full flight simulator training side, how are you seeing things develop? Because uh, you briefly touched upon it earlier. You said we're seeing different startups mm -hmm. uh, emerge in, in India. Do you think we'll see the same across the Middle East? Um. You know what we have been seeing in the Middle East is a lot of airlines. So many years ago, airlines started with training centers under their umbrella. And then in the last maybe 10, 15 years have spun those training centers off and made them independent training centers. And what we're finding now to be a trend in the region is a lot of these airlines are now adopting these training centers back under their umbrellas, whether through acquiring them, through if they had sold them off yeah. previously. So it's interesting to actually see them taking that capability back under their wing. Do you think that is also because airlines at the moment are doing quite well and there's that such high demand for full flight simulator training capacity? Uh, what do you think is the main driver behind it? I think maybe it's it? a crucial time and they want to have complete oversight of the training and okay. the expansion and knowing how many the throughput will be how many pilots you can get through recurrent training yeah. etc instead of outsourcing it okay um well thank you for sharing your insights with us today Kinda. um if anyone is interested to learn more about uh l3 harris commercial aviation services uh, please visit their website if you're interested to connect with Kinda, she's on linkedin uh, if i'm not mistaken also very active on linkedin <laughs> so yeah thank you very much thank for